Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us in this less than ideal Lubbock weather today. Uh, I'm Ben Powell, I'm the director of the Free Market Institute, uh, and I'm very pleased to be able to kick off our 10th anniversary uh, celebrations with our public event tonight featuring Dr. Vernon Smith. Uh, I will promote what we're doing the rest of the, or some of the things we're doing the rest of the semester in recognition of our anniversary. Next up in our lecture series will be Dr. Finn Kidland, uh, who is the co-recipient of the 2004 Nobel Prize in Economics, and he'll be giving a lecture on economic policy and the growth of nations. And another public event we have going on is a little bit different at the end of the semester. At, uh, the first Thursday in May, we'll be having our first FMI charity golf tournament for anybody who would like to join. Uh, we have, we have uh, uh, team admissions or single entries are both welcome. There's flyers out there on the FMI table that have the web address where you can register if you'd like to join us for what should be a fun day of me embarrassing myself playing golf. <laughs> so a little over 10 years ago, my wife Lisa and I decided to uproot our family and move here to Lubbock to start the Free Market Institute. And we were both very optimistic that we thought Lubbock and Texas Tech was going to be a great place to do this. And 10 years later, both Texas Tech and Lubbock have exceeded both of our already high expectations. It's been fantastic being here. It's a true pleasure to work with my colleagues at FMI, the faculty, the PhD students, the staff there, but the entire university and Lubbock community has been great support for us. Uh, the community coming out to events like this and also financially supporting our activities. Uh, the university, from the leadership, uh, from tech systems at the chancellor's office, through the president's office, through various deans and our colleagues at different colleges, have been a tremendously welcoming group. And within Texas Tech, we've had no more important supporter than President Lawrence Skubinek, uh, who was with starting the Free Market Institute from the very beginning. Back when he was a dean, he was the one who erased the original grant that got FMI started, and then had the wisdom or bad judgment, depending on who you ask, to recruit me to start the institute. Uh, and I'm very grateful for his support in getting it going, but also for the subsequent 10 years, everything he's done to encourage me and the institute to grow and, and helped us do that. And I'd like him to come up and make just a few remarks, if you would, President Skubinek. Thank you, Ben. Um, uh, it has been uh, an amazing success. Uh, when I think of the things that just turned out so wonderfully, the new initiatives we've taken on in the last few years, I think of the Vet School, I think of the Free Market Institute. And that's, that's a pretty lofty company. Since this is the 10th anniversary, I, I want to share a bit about the history of its establishment. Uh, as Ben said, I was the Dean of Arts and Sciences at the time, and I was notified by a gentleman, Matt Matthews, who is a rancher, a wonderful family, that he wanted to come and visit. So I was waiting outside Holden Hall, and I see this gentleman coming, and you could tell he just, just got off the ranch. Um, I, uh, I make, this is kind of a tacky joke, but I don't know if any of you have been to Jibo's. It's a farm store here, and if, if you buy your clothes there, you can tell it. <laughs> and this is, I think, her map on his clothes. And uh, so he visited for a couple of hours, and you could tell he was a very deep, thoughtful man. And he took out a check and made the initial gift that launched this free market institute. Since then, more than $25 million have been raised through philanthropic support for this institute. But it started with Matt Matthews. Uh, after we had visited, he said, let's go get something to eat. And um, he wanted to ask me about a discussion we were having on campus of a new financial management plan. It's called Responsibility Centered Management, where every uh, entity on campus basically lives by its own revenues. And I said to, to Matt, I said, well, I don't know if this is going to happen because as President Wilson said when he was president of Princeton, it's easier to move a cemetery than to change a university. And Matt Matthews said, President Wilson, if not for him, we wouldn't have had the Treaty of Versailles that led to World War II and the Federal Reserve System. <laughs> 
and I realized I had cited the wrong person. <laughs> but that's the kind of individual he was. Um, and then we were so fortunate uh, to bring Ben here. There were many people who entered into that decision. I want to mention Larry Gill and all of those who worked with the Kickapoo Foundation. They were extraordinarily generous. And I did reach out to Dr. Vernon Smith to get his opinion on who would be a good leader. And there are many others. I think I saw that Fred Franson is going to be here. He was somebody else. There were so many. But I think what's been so wonderful about the Free Market Institute is that Texas Tech was the right place for it. Our student body was interested in how a free market works. Um, this is an accepting community uh, on this campus and throughout this region that recognizes the value of these kind of discussions. And if you look at what's happened with the Free Market Institute, it's touched so many different parts of this campus. Um, ben gave me a bunch of statistics, and it would be way too much to go over this. But I want to highlight a few things. There are now nine faculty in the Free Market Institute. They have appointments in the Davis College, the Rawls College, the College of Arts and Science, Science, uh, Sciences. Some are affiliated in the Department of Philosophy and, uh, and, and other places. Um, I, I thought it was quite amazing that more than 6,300 students during the, uh, the existence of this Free Market Institute have been instructed by these faculty. Uh, there are uh, 10 current PhD students in the program that have graduated, 10 that have graduated, and I could go on, um, 12 books, thousands of papers. But it's research of very high quality. And that was one thing Ben promised when he came. When he came. Um, this is about quality research. It also makes a difference in how this economy works. So this has been a tremendous success due to the efforts of so many. Uh, it's, I think this is a wonderful attribute and resource we have at Texas Tech. Thank you, Ben, for all you've done. And I think if you look around this room right now, it says a lot that you would show up. I don't know what you mean by not a great days. <laughs> and hey, by the way, I don't think we should cancel class in the morning. <laughs> but I think it says a lot about the impact of the Free Market Institute. Thank you all. Thank you, Lawrence. Now it's my distinct pleasure and honor to be able to introduce Dr. Vernon Smith. Dr. Smith is the George REO Endowed Chair in Finance and Economics, Professor of Economics and Law, and a faculty member with the Smith Institute for Political Economy and Philosophy at Chapman University. Prior to joining Chapman University, Dr. Smith held faculty appointments at the University of Arizona, Purdue University, Brown, the University of Massachusetts, and George Mason University, where I first met him when I was a PhD student there myself. Dr. Smith completed his undergraduate degree in electrical engineering at Caltech, a master's degree in economics from the University of Kansas, where he informed me that's where he got his education, and then subsequently a PhD from Harvard, where apparently he got his degree. <laughs> Dr. Smith completed, uh, has authored or co-authored more than 375 articles and books on capital theory, finance, natural resource economics, and experimental economics, including his most recent 2022 book, Economics of Markets, Neoclassical Theory, Experiments, and the Theory of Classical Price Discovery. He is a past president of the Public Choice Society, the Economic Science Association, the Western Economic Association, and the Association of Private Enterprise Education, which he was also recognized by with their Adam Smith Award in 1995. And fun little personal twist on this story, the Free Market Institute is now the administrative home of the Association of Private Enterprise Education. And I'm sure Vernon has a special place in his heart for that association, because back when he won that award, he met his wife, Candace Smith, who is over here with us and is going to be teaching a course on etiquette for the Rawls students tomorrow night, because she was serving on that association's board of directors back then. Uh, Dr. Smith is a distinguished fellow of the American Economics Association. He was elected a member of the National Academy of Sciences in 1995, and in 2002, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences for his groundbreaking work in experimental economics. Please join me in welcoming back to Texas Tech. Well, thank you.
you, Ben. Uh, it's a great pleasure to come back to Texas Tech a second time with my wife, Candace, who's teaching an etiquette class tomorrow, and I'm going to attend. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it's a great uh, pleasure to be here. And I want to begin uh, my title, uh, Propriety, Property, and Price Discover, Discovery in Adam Smith and Classical Economics. I want to begin by explaining that uh, uh, title. Uh, and it's based on work with two co-authors, uh, Bart Wilson, who I believe has attended to, and to t uh, Texas Tech to, to speak earlier, a couple of couple, three years ago, and we, uh, we wrote uh, together Humanomics, and then a more recent uh, co-author of mine, Sabiu Inoua, our uh, Economics of Markets. So, and the, now the, the uh, I have two, there's two parts to this talk. The first part on propriety and property comes from Adam Smith's first book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And the second part comes mostly from chapter seven of The Wealth of Nations, actually the first uh, seven chapters, but mostly, mostly chapter, and that's about how buyers and sellers discover prices in markets. And I'm going to begin each of these two parts with an experiment that will kind of give you, uh, because it was largely through experiments and, and, and finding wisdom in Adam Smith as to what to expect to happen in those experiments that has drawn me into more and more closer to, to studying uh, Adam Smith's um, uh, major two books. So, the, uh, Okay, he, he wrote two books. Uh, the Theory of Moral Sentiments was published in uh, 1759, The Wealth of Nations, in the year of our revolution, uh, 1776. The first book uh, models community and society. I think of that as produce, providing a theory of society. And it's based upon morality. And as David Hume says, uh, the rules of morality are not the result of reason. And Smith's theory of moral sentiments really develops that idea quite carefully. Uh, the morality emerges. Uh, it begins, as Adam Smith argued, with uh, the our earliest religions had icons of, of good and evil that provided kind of models of, 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 of good community and bad community, okay? But <clears throat> it's, uh, it emerges out of the exper people's experience of each other's and their social communities. That's where society comes from. And then when he wrote The Wealth of Nations, he basically was extending uh, the reciprocity principles that we practice in our social world. Uh, th those are applied to the economy. And uh, I particular, in the second part of the talk, want to emphasize the, uh, the uh, theory of, the eco of economy based on markets, uh, that part of the Wealth of Nations, which is particularly developed in the first seven chapters. And I will use an experiment to introduce each of these that I think will relate this to uh, my experience, the experience of students, and also I think audiences uh, kind of appreciate these, these experiments. All right, I want to begin uh, with a simple, what we call a trust game. This is played uh, by two persons. We, uh, we recruit people to the laboratory. There might be 20 in the room, and they're uh, 
randomly matched into, uh, into pairs, and one or the other is the, uh, chosen as the first mover randomly, and the other is the second mover. And so, you know, notice here, person one, if person one moves right, uh, that person makes $12, and the person he's paired with, orange, makes $12. Okay. If one passes to two, notice that one, and the main point I want to make about this game is that everybody analyzes it in the same way. Okay. So if one passes to two and two pa plays down, notice that one is made worse off and two is made better off. One now gets six dollars, two makes four. So everybody looks at this game and interprets it in the same way. One is made better off if he, if he gets more money. He's made uh, worse off if he gets less. So everyone looks at this at the same. So implicitly, everybody assumes that there's common knowledge that everyone is self-interested. Okay. Now, uh, Adam Smith distinguished between being self-interested and acting in your self-interest. You see, the, these are separate uh, phenomena and separate actions. Uh, so, and the, I mean, so a person <clears throat> may be self-interested but not always act in their self-interest. So, <clears throat> if we assume that these players also act in their self-interest, then it's easy to analyze, analyze this game. One should play right at the top, because if one passes to two, two will defect and play down and make one worse off. So that's the way, the common way we analyze this game. Now, how do real people play this game for money? Well, here's 49 pairs of, and these are all undergraduate students, but we've done these experiments with, uh, when I was at George Mason University, we attended a, uh, a, a congressional retreat. And so we, could, we ran this game, these experiments, with, with uh, uh, st staff of, uh, of, become, of congressional and, senator, and, and senators, you see. Same result, basically. Roughly half, a little bit more half, play down. And of the twos, then they get an opportunity to play. Two thirds play right, and one third play down. So <clears throat> clearly, this def this defies the logic that people were going to act in their self-interest. Now, Adam Smith, and his in the theory of moral sentiments, explains predicts these results in the theory of moral sentiments. Okay, he says, here is the fair play. Uh, rule that TMS says we follow. And by the way, fair play, <clears throat> uh, fair in the 18th century uh, meant fair in the sense of the rules of the game. The opposite of fair was foul. The opposite of fair was not unfair. You see, the English language evolved that. Today we think of uh, the opposite of fair is unfair, and we're thinking about distributions, what people. Uh, uh, but, but, this, but Smith made this important uh, distinction. And <clears throat> so, but anyway, here's, an, an, and you'll find this on page 112, and he doesn't name the proposition as we have here. I call this the beneficence proposition one. He says, actions of a beneficent tendency which proceed from proper motives, and he has in mind there that it was intentional, okay, if not an accident, seem alone to require reward because such alone are the approved objects of gratitude. So he's saying, so if Ben some, does something that, to me, to benefit me, he's saying that I feel uh, a, a, a need to re, replay that. that we have a, I have a debt of gratitude. In fact, that's, uh, uh, that's a, a, an important phrase in the English language, having a debt of gratitude. So, um, th this uh, proposition predicts the evolution of reciprocity in communities and in society and eventually uh, trade and economy. Uh, 
So, in, in the theory of moral sentiments, sociology's model as a maturation process. Okay, it begins. It, it, it begins, he says, about the time we start at school, and we start to learn to go along with our neighbors. Okay and following rules tending to restrain or, or modify our actions based on what Smith calls the notion of self-command. So this is very much a bottom-up kind of a process. Uh, and we're all strictly self-interested, Smith says, but you cannot look your neighbor in the face and avow that all your actions are taken in your self-interest. Hence do we, he says, humble the arrogance of our self-love to bring it down to what others will go along with. So that's his model of everybody is self-interested, but also because we want to get along with our neighbors and our friends, we learn to, to take actions which take them into account when we take these actions. He uses the phrase go along with 41 times. That's about every eight or nine pages, so he wants you to get that. Okay. Now, his model offers additional kind of fair play prediction rules. For example, he has beneficence proposition two. Beneficence is always free. It cannot be extorted by force. The mere want of beneficence exposes to no punishment because the mere want of beneficence tends to do no real positive evil. Now, he, what he's, mathematically what he's doing is setting the zero point of the set of beneficent actions that one person might do for another. What, how about the zero? How about the, the failure to be beneficence? Is that something that's punishment? Punished? No. He says that does no positive real evil, so that in in trust games, you see, we should not expect player twos to, willing to, to be willing to incur a cost uh, to uh, punish player ones for not choosing down. And so uh, it, it's sort of respected that that's the right of, 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 of such a person. And so we, we can test that. Here's the game I was just showing you on the left. On the right, Suppose we take, uh, if one moves, moves right on the right game at the top, suppose play passes to two. Two then can choose between the 12-12 outcome or at a cost to himself, if he doesn't like it that one didn't play down, he can punish you. But we make that a costly. So this is, this is one way. And you see this is, this is suggested directly by, by Adam Smith's proposition. That proposition is very general, but it's pretty easy to find ways to map that into real actions by people in communities and also uh, in these laboratory experiments. So, notice here, do people punish one uh, uh, beneficence? No. We have uh, 23 people out of 38 pairs. 23 of the ones move right. And the twos, none of them uh, uh, play down. They all move right. But notice that play in the right game differs from the one in the left. People are changing the way they analyze the game. Uh, for one thing, notice that in the right game, we have 39% playing down rather than, than uh, 55 uh, on the left. Well, that's a good idea because notice that the twos are defecting much more commonly. So they're really adding that node, you see, is changing the way people are, are, are playing and, and perceiving that, that game. Uh, <clears throat> they see that one's, uh, one sees that two, whether it plays right or down, two can defect and, and uh, cause trouble for him, and so Probably what people are doing is looking, looking at the game and saying that, well, the least damage is if I play it right rather than down. But clearly, this this uh, this invites a lot more experiments to to, to try to uh, understand what's going on in that game. Now, uh, 
suppose now uh, there's another way to think about introducing punishments. Suppose that uh, in the right game, the play one, a pair of one, player one plays down, and then if two defects by playing down, suppose play pass, passes back to one, and now one chooses between the outcome of 642 or one can severely punish, you see, two for that action, reduce his payoff from $42 to four. So here's a, a and it turns out that Adam Smith has a, <clears throat> a proposition that precisely covers that. Yeah, he says that uh, the fair play rule calls for not punishing a want of beneficence because it does no real positive evil. But apparently, uh, in the justice proposition, he provides conditions where, where, where you very much feel the need to punish a person who hurts. And this is the obverse of the beneficence proposition. Uh, Adam Smith says, actions of a hurtful tendency, which proceed from improper motives, meaning you hurt me and that's exactly what you intended to do, seem alone to deserve punishment, because such alone are the pro approved objects of resentment. So we have gratitude underlying, uh, underlying beneficent actions resentment and punishment underlying uh, uh, hurtful actions. Well, uh, apply that to this, uh, to this new game on the right, and we see that 24% of the, of the ones uh, punish the defection on twos. 24%, you see in the bottom uh, uh, right node here are playing down. Now you might ask, well, why, why aren't you punishing even higher? Because they're very low cost. You can really, really reduce this guy's payoff by a substantial amount. Well, Adam Smith talks about that. He says that above all, the fair and impartial spectator wants the, the punishment to fit the infraction. Punishment should be neither too large or too small. So I think that's what we're seeing here, and it invites to see uh, varying this uh, this uh, cost of punishment uh, to see if if that can support that idea that he has in that game. So there's a lot, there's a rich uh, bunch of of propositions come out of the theory of moral sentiments that you can actually apply today, and it, and and the propositions help you to see in the case of experiment, I will design the experiment to, to fit the conditions of the proposition. So his model of human sociability and society leads to two summary propositions, beneficence and justice. These are the two pillars of society. Beneficence is about the neighborly good things we do for each other. Justice is obverse and only about achieving security from injury. You see, that's the more, that's basically people are protecting themselves. The urge to punish, you see, a, a hurtful act is a way of trying to deterring that and protecting yourself from, from that. So in the theory of moral sense, the whole idea of justice as security from injury is, is, is developed. And out of that comes property. Uh, because security from injury means limiting or deterring the hurtful things that we do to each other. Murder is the most hurtful thing that can be done. Theft and robbery come mixed, and then violation of contract in commercial and personal affairs. Well, those, th this, so justice is really about property. If you, by controlling murder, by living in a society in which, it, which is that it's controlled and limited, we each have property in our bodies as a result of that. That's a security effect of that. Uh, theft, if we control theft and robbery, then we have property in the products of our bodies, okay? The goods and services that we, we provide. And 
And finally, we have prophecy in each other's uh, promises if we have uh, punishment or violation of contract, or if we have. Uh, now, violation of contract tends to involve compensation, though, and not uh, punishment. So, <clears throat> anyway, these two pillars of society, according to the uh, Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments, justice is the more essential. Society cannot subsist among those who are at all times ready to hurt and injure each other. Beneficence, therefore, is essential to the existence, less essential to the existence of society than justice. But I want you to notice that both these pillars of society require common knowledge that all are self-interested. If we don't all have a common understanding about what it means to benefit another person, or hurt another person, we don't have any way of implementing these propositions. So that's uh, common knowledge of, uh, of self-interest is, 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 is essential to this. <clears throat> okay, now many behavioral economists say that other regarding action is due to social preferences. The concept of social preferences that have been used to identify that. But yet they analyze the trust game based upon self-interest. So, and then invoke social preferences. Well, but if, if preferences are social, you can't conclude that some, because somebody got less that he's made, uh, that he or she is hurt by that. Or in fact, they get more at their benefit. Uh, maybe you want to give money to the other person if you have social preferences. So you really, the notion of self-interest is, is, is very important and central here. And, and Smith has this kind of unique way, much different than model, model, uh, modern scholars, for uh, modeling uh, the uh, social relations that we have and that we develop. <clears throat> so now I want to turn to uh, part two and talk about markets in the, uh, uh, in the wealth of nations. And I'm only going, I'm not only going to consider uh, consumer non durable goods markets, because I want to only, and in fact, all my early experiments, those were the kind of markets that, that we were talking about. We were not talking about goods that can be uh, bought and resold. We're talking about goods like uh, hamburgers, haircuts, uh, hotel rooms that the consumer buys or rents to use, not to resell. That's about 75% of private products can't be retraded. Uh, the other 25% that can, like homes, automobiles, furniture, that's where all the instability comes in macroeconomics, the stuff that can be retraded. The stuff that, thank goodness, 75% of them can't be retraded because that's where the stability is. As soon as there is a value for something for resale, then the other motivations and uh, interests come into that. So I'm going to just focus on that. And here's my first experiment in January 1956. And this was an oral outcry, double auction. I had, it was a principal's class, I had 22 sophomores in that class. And I uh, made 11 of them buyers, and I, I gave the buyers here <coughs> private secret values representing the worth of this abstract good uh, to them if they bought, bought a unit from a seller. So here's a buyer here with a value of $3.25 that he's been given, and if he buys that for, uh, <coughs> say, for a dollar, uh, I owe him $2.20. So buyers are motivated to buy cheap. Sellers are motivated by high, to, to, 
to, to sell high because they're given costs, and they make the difference between the price at which they sell and the cost to the license assigned them. Each person knows their own value or cost, but nothing about the others. Okay. So those were the conditions of this experiment. And the results in an open outcry auction really astounded me. It converged very quickly to the supply and demand equilibrium. No one, mid-20th mid century, in economics or economic theory, would believe that a bunch of sophomores walk into a room, you give them this information, and they find the equilibrium of the game. No one would believe that. No one taught that. We all believe that for supply and demand to work, everybody had to have complete information on the, on the supply and demand conditions. And that doesn't hold here. Each person only knew his own little fragment of the total. Also, we believe you had to have a very large number of buyers and sellers. You couldn't get by here. Yeah. So here we have 22. I've done it with three or four, and the supply and demand still organizes, the supply and demand diagram still organizes that, what happens in those markets. Okay, so no one would believe this, and I didn't believe it. And I thought probably what explains this is there's too much symmetry. What's wrong with the experiment is the the market clearing price is also the average cost and the average value. Too much symmetry. So I, there's an asymmetric case that converts too. The first 12 experiments that I published in, in 1962 in the JPE were all came from what I was finding that no one believed. And <clears throat> so you see that right away changed my life. And because I ended up doing more of these, I found that I can learn stuff that I didn't know before, and moreover, other people didn't know it. And the notice here also that this diagram has a, I've got price on the vertical axis. That's wrong. You don't put price on the vertical axis of the supply and demand space. The textbooks are all wrong. Alfred Marshall did it. That's wrong. There's no prices over here in the left-hand diagram. There's only values and costs. There's no prices. Prices come about as a result of inter interactions of buyers and sellers, and they're being generated through some, some institutional setup that enables buyers and sellers to get in to contact with each other and make deals. So the prices come out of this, but they're not in this diagram. What's here is we have a distribution, a negative distribution function of values and a positive distribution function of seller willingness to accept uh, costs. Uh, so the important thing is that the classical economists represent market agents very much as we do today in auction theory. Uh, you see, if you go to an auction, there's something up for sale, and you <coughs> notice that the buying, that the bids start out low, and there's lots of them, the bids start to rise and people drop out of the market. People drop out of the bidding as the price gets higher and finally, and finally there's one person willing to pay more than anyone else in the room, and that person buys it. Well, you see, Smith knew about auctions, and he, he, and he makes side comments about auctions from time to time, and you realize, you see, that he, <clears throat> uh, down here, for example, he says if two buyers equally desire an item, the one with the larger wealth will carry it. So he understands that the high bidder wins, that wealth matters, you see, tastes and wealth matter, and, uh, and, he, uh, and that's the way he thought generally about supply and demand in larger markets, you see. So, <clears throat> okay, uh, now the thing about uh, when we write 
a demand function, quantity as a function of something, really it's a function of the buyer's values. Okay, that's all that we can talk about. Each has a maximum willingness to pay. That's revealed in every auction, okay? And, and symmetrically, uh, uh, sellers have a minimum amount they're willing to accept. And that may vary with a lot of different conditions, of course. Uh, <clears throat> And, and Smith discusses, it, discusses that. He's, um, a lot of those basic uh, conditions. So, uh, so we have buyers motivated uh, to buy low, sellers motivated to sell high, and through their higgling and bargaining, as Adam Smith describes it in chapter seven, they reach contracts, okay? All right, uh, now in chapter seven of the Wealth of Nations, uh, he discusses uh, price discovery. He, he earlier talks about goods having utility value, that's why people want to buy them. Uh, and also there is a concept of exchange value, which is the price. He discusses these two different uh, concepts points out that, that prices then depend very much on competitive entry. That's true of both buyers and sellers, but he saw that, I think, as a particular problem with sellers because uh, of mercantilism, the cozy relationship often between government and producers and sellers. So that he saw that as a potential greater problem in terms of getting entry and, and sufficient uh, competition in, in the market. So I think that's why he prim primarily emphasized that, emphasizes that. But here in chapter 7, he points out a basic mechanism for uh, equilibration or the determination of prices in markets. He says, if the quantity brought to market falls short of effectual demand, those willing to pay the supply price cannot be supplied, in other words, purchases, are limited by supply. Some will bid for what they can get and the price will increase. Okay, and that's quite general. It doesn't have to have anything to do with what sellers bring to market. On our experiments, the buyers and sellers are all there together. And if, the, and if the price starts out low, precisely these kinds of conditions apply. And on the other hand, he says, if the quantity brought exceeds demand, it can all be sold and willing, uh, to buyers willing to pay the supply and price. Uh, so it either may increase in the first case here, in this case it falls. So sales now is limited by demand. So the two-part theory in the wealth of nations of price uh, discovery has a very, has, has essentially a mathematical form the first part is that price change has the same sign as excess demand. And secondly, at any price, the contracted quantity is limited by the minimum of amount demanded or supplied, the quantity that's traded. So those, those are conditions that we can write out, write mathematically. Uh, the price adjustment rule here in uh, item two is that price change and excess demand, think of that at E and P, excess demand as a function of price, have the same sign, so that the product is always positive. Uh, and then, now in, in our economics of market, we introduce a, an, a valuation function, V of P, which just summar, summarizes for any price what the profitability in the total market is uh, from the perspective of both buyers and sellers. And mathematically, that is the integral of, of excess supply. But if you write it for discrete values down here, uh, at any price, all we're doing is summing over those values of buyers that are profitable at that price, and we're summing over those costs of sellers that are profitable at that price. So V of P here is just the overall distance between price and the trader's valuations. And that, and that it's easily 
generalize this to multiple markets. There's just a line connect, think a line connected in, in, in uh, multiple commodity space, you see, uh, uh, connecting the <clears throat> uh, the price of a, a price which is a deviation from those from those values and costs. So it's the overall distance of in profits measured in profit space between price and the trader's reservation reservation values or costs. <clears throat> okay, so we and uh, Sabu and I say that we think of P star as the center of market value. It, P star minimizes this V of P function. It minimizes the distance between price and these traders valuations. It maximizes the profits or surplus actually collected in, in, in transactions by buyers and sellers. And it also uh, maximizes trade, which at any price will be the minimum you see between the amount supplied and demanded. And, and of course, that <clears throat> uh, think of a, a, a willingness to sell at a constant price, which is flat. That means that where demand crosses supply determines the, the amount traded, and there may be very well lots of other people willing to trade, you see, at that price. So this takes care, takes care of, of sort of pathological or unusual uh, conditions. <clears throat> so the principle of maximum information, what we claim, is that market price evolves so as to reflect value better and better. So this change of value with transactions is never positive. It tends to always improve. Okay. So this is the, uh, implicitly, this is the, uh, let's see, the classical foundations that we find in modern writers like Hyde and the mathematical tool uh, by Leo Hurwitz, Ryder Radner, that emphasized the information properties of, of markets. And I'm going to show you, uh, we use Shannon, uh, he was an electrical engineer at MIT, who uh, proposed a, a, a model that we apply to this, an information model that, uh, that enables us to, to speak of the information content of prices. But first, here's, here's a chart. On, the, on panel one here, we have a, a negative, here's a distribution function of of values, and here's a rising supply distribution function that's approaching a, 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 an asymptotically uh, max. And, and here we have, uh, in, in, the, in one, also notice that if price is below P star, then demand is limited by, uh, by supply. If price is above P star, then, then it's, it's the reverse with supply not being able to exceed demand. And over here in panel two, the V of P function reaches a minimum at P star, and that surplus collected by the buyers and sellers reaches a maximum there. And across time, you see prices here tend to, uh, tend, to tend to converge. Now, uh, Shannon, uh, no, well, first notice that, a, that if we have a trade between a buyer and a seller for the price P, that, that buyer, uh, the value is not lower than the price, otherwise he's losing money, and the cost is not higher than that price. So a price includes, matches a buyer and seller at a value and a cost, and that previously private information is now publicized in that price P. You don't know exactly where the value and the cost are, but you know that, it's, that, that P, uh, it's P is inside that interval, you see, at the value and cost. Well, uh, so a, a trade means that the value 
traded and economized by that exchange is greater than the cost used up. Okay, the value created is, 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 is and for society as a whole, if all trades are like that, you see, we we have profits imply that each individual's uh, what is coming in is greater than what is going out. That's all profit means. It just means your, your return, your revenue, is greater than your cost. If you have a household, you, you want to have more coming in than going out. Okay? So profit is really very simple. And everybody wants it and likes it. Uh, the Shannon proposed measuring the information in an event realization by the log probability of that event. So, in this model, the change in information with respect to price is simply the log of demand, demand divided by supply. And that means that uh, the change in information with a transaction, with each transaction, is never negative. It always thinks information is getting better as uh, that V of P function is getting smaller. So these are the ways you see that Sabu and I are characterizing, giving a mathematical characterization of the original classic uh, system. Okay, uh, now notice that we've, there's no parameters in this model yet. Uh, when you have a particular institution of trade, that brings parameters into all. Uh, it says something about how, how buyers and sellers find each other and reach contracts, the rules that govern that, that institution of trade. Uh, the oral outcry op, uh, market is one which sellers, buyers announce bids, sellers announce ask. A new bid has to be higher, a new ask has to be lower. That's an example of the structure that an institution puts on a, on a market. So I'm going to illustrate all of these principles with the multiple unit English auction, say with Q equal 4. So here on the upper left, we have four sellers willing to sell at any price above 10. We have buyers with, with uh, arrayed their demand schedule. And so Bill Vickery tells us how to do an English auction, not for one unit, say, but for four. You start the bidding out. Suppose the bidding starts at 12. Someone bids 12 cents. And you've got, got to get three matches of that before anybody can raise it. And then somebody can raise the price, say, to 20. And then you want to get three matches, you can raise it again. So the, so the mechanism just marches up and assures that it will that we're going to have four people able to trade. And so here's the I of P, V of P functions over here. Uh, and here's price uh, going up in that sequence until it hits the, the uh, uh, in that center, you see, between four, somewhere in 40, and, uh, 40 or 50. And we have values here, uh, uh, the V of T function, uh, uh, falling over that period. Okay. So, well, there we are. Okay, now the summary. So, uh, Smith's model of social out action outperforms the standard neoclassical economics model and trust gains, gains by a factor of two to one. We had no way, by the way. We started to do these experiments uh, in the late 80s, so we've been doing them by nearly 90. We've been doing them for over 30 years. Results continue to average out. You see precisely as I showed you. We had no explanation of that. But I found it in one. Smith's propositions and theorem on elements. And so, and the key in his model, as I've emphasized, is distinguish, distinguishing between being self interested, which we all are, and choosing, deliberately choosing to act in a self interested 
way. And self-command, as Adam Smith called it, limits self-interested choice by rules and enables us to go along with our neighbors. And, of course, the modern formulation is to say that A is chosen over B if and only if the utility of A is greater than the utility of A. In other words, it's all about consequences. There's no distinction, you see, between origins and consequences in the model way, in a modern way of thinking. There was always in Smith's mind. <clears throat> and in fact, he, you see, in the only F part of that, he had a different way. It wasn't utility, it wasn't preferences. It was this model of, of the, the rules that we learn to follow. <clears throat> so, uh, neoclassical Max Schuh economics derived optimal quantity demanded or supplied given prices, and it did that before prices could have been discovered. That's not, an, that's not a pattern of thinking that well prepares you, you see, to articulate the way it is, the way it is that people find prices in markets. And Smith did that. He didn't make this that pattern error. So I want to uh, close by pointing out that you can download these two books free at the, uh, the uh, Liberty Fund site. The online Liberty Fund, and I urge you to study, not to read me, but to read this guy. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you.